Hi everyone. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, also on time. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Anwara Kumari, and today I'm here to talk about accessibility. Uh, specifically, I will be talking about how can we use developer tools for uh, web accessibility testing. So, but before that, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for this conference. And I'm joining this for the first time, and yeah, I'm really excited. This is also my first time in Brno. So, if you have any <laughs> recommendations for me about Brno, do let me know after the talk. Also, questions about the talk. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, also thank you to everyone and to volunteers for uh, making this event possible. So. Yeah, let's get started. So uh, I really like this quote, and uh, to start the talk with, uh, it just shows the importance of web accessibility, actually. So this is a very old tweet by uh, Laren, and uh, it reads that, today my dad cried over the phone. He wanted one week where he could use his computer without my help. He's blind. Each inaccessible website tells him, you aren't welcome in this world. If you don't know whether your website or app is accessible, it's not. So start learning. So let's start with this. So a bit of introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anuradha. I'm a senior software developer. I work at Vodafone Zigo in um, Netherlands. Uh, I'm also a Google developers expert, Microsoft MVP, and a Women Tech Makers ambassador and accessibility advocate. I talk a lot about web accessibility. And uh, if you would like to connect with me, you can connect with me on LinkedIn at Anuradha15 or on Twitter at Miracle underscore 404. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we will start with a bit of introduction about accessibility and why is it important. Then we will dive into how can we test for accessibility and we will explore uh, different types of ways in which we can uh, test for accessibility in the developer tools. A uh, Chrome DevTools would be the focus. And I will also give some tips on testing the accessibility. So what is accessibility? Or it is also neuro named as A11Y. Uh, here, 11 means uh, the, it's the number between A and Y of the word. Uh, it means making resources and services usable by everyone, regardless of their abilities or disabilities. So, why is accessibility important? Uh, because whatever we are building, we build it for our users. So, it's important that all our users can use. Uh, our websites and applications. and But when we are building it, we tend to forget that our users can be very diverse. So usually, what we do is we test in a very certain way, in a very focused way, and we think in a very focused way. And so we tend to miss the diversity of our users, which harms the inclusion of our websites and applications. As per WHO, World Health Organization, Around 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability, and it translates to 1 billion. And I'm sure it's a bit more than that, so it's a bit old data as well. So there are different types of disabilities, and they are broadly categorized into like visual, auditory, motor, cognitive. And uh, there is a very nice design guideline by Microsoft, Microsoft Inclusive Design. And it actually talks a lot about how can we uh, include, how can we make our design and our websites and applications more inclusive. And it's a very nice thought process. I really recommend everyone to go ahead and read it, because that focuses on that uh, there is no like the users don't lack in abilities, actually. We lack in bridging the gap. Because if we develop things properly, users will be able to use it. But when we develop, when we code, we do not take care enough. And that's why the gap, and that's why the exclusion in web or digital world. Uh, and uh, it talks about how uh, different kinds of disabilities can uh, translate. So like, for example, if we take, let's say, sorry, uh, a vision disability. So there can be different types of category here as well, right? Someone can be a permanent disabled, like they might be blind from birth. Then there could be temporary disabilities, let's say, 
some uh, eye issues happen, maybe a cataract or any infection or anything. So while I was able to see properly, but due to this temporary situation in my eye, I still am disabled temporarily and I still need some assistive technologies to use the digital world for that amount of time. Then th that could be situational. So a good example is, let's say we are using a mobile in bright sun outside, okay? So we are trying to navigate somewhere and we are using mobile, but the contrast may be not good enough, and so we are not able to see things properly on your mobile when we are out. So this is situational. I can see perfectly fine when I'm inside, but due to the situation, due to that bright sunlight, and because the contra contrast was not proper of that website, I was still not able to access all the information or things that I wanted to access. So this translates to all different kinds of disabilities. So, since there are different types of disabilities, so there are different ways in which we can access the web. First is keyboard. So keyboard is a kind of assistive technology as well. Yes, we use it most of the times, but also there are some users who are only dependent on the keyboards. Like, they don't use mouse or the touchpads or anything due to different kinds of disabilities, so they are totally reliant on keyboards, so we need to ensure that whatever we are developing is totally accessible with keyboard as well. Then there are voiceovers or uh, uh, screen readers. So for every machine, like every laptop or every mobile, we have inbuilt voiceover or screen reader. So users, many users use it, and so whatever we create, needs to be accessible to all these different types of assistive technologies. Then, this is kind of a bit complicated one, uh, but this is a braille display. So, here, let's say whatever is on our website, it gets translated into braille display, and the user can touch it and understand that what is on the screen. So, uh, there are different kinds of things. I just wanted to show a few of these. Now, to the main point, how can we test for accessibility? There are multiple ways in which we can test. Uh, I'm going to focus first on a very specific browser tools, but we should be able to test, like whenever we are testing, we should unplug mouse or something, and we should test just using keyboard. We should also test using screen readers. Then there are different tools and extensions which come with every browser, so that, and also, by default, in browsers, we have certain tools, developer tools, which we can use to test and actually debug. So this is more of the focus on when we are developing something, how can we debug for some issues as well, and how can we understand. So let's see. Developer tools. So uh, now I will use my keyboard because demo. So the, uh, one of them which I think you might know uh, is Lighthouse. So Lighthouse is something which we use very often if we are developing. Uh, so we go to any website and then we can inspect or the open the developer tools. So this is what I'm talking uh, majorly about. And yeah, I'm going to use the conference website <laughs> to just test everything. <laughs> uh, uh, so here we have a Lighthouse panel. We can test for multiple things, of course. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use a test for accessibility for desktop. And let's analyze the page load. Also, if it's not readable, just let me know. I will increase the font size as well. So shout if you are not able to read properly whatever is on the screen. Uh, so. Uh, when Lighthouse report comes, it gives us a report of the page that we are scanning. So this is home page here. Uh, the score actually doesn't matter much. It, it can be sometimes 100, and still our website can be totally inaccessible. So this is not the measure of percentage of accessibility of the website or something. This only detects the automatic tests, like there are some of the accessibility issues, like a subset, which we can detect automatically. And if they have some issues, it gets detected by Lighthouse. And it gives a very nice overview of what are those issues. For example, we have an image, which does not have an alt attribute. And we can scroll it into view to see which image is it talking about. So it's the red hat image. Okay. That's fine. 
So we can use this to find out these are the low hanging fruits, right? So these are the issues which we can find and we can learn also about why these are the issues or what is the importance of this specific error. How can we fix it? We can understand more about this, read and fix it in the proper way. So this is all that Lighthouse does, right? But this is not what we are going to focus today. This is just the starting point that here we start from. Like this is something which we all use we can use, but again, just want to focus that, because I see many people focusing on the number, don't focus on the number. It should be 100, yes, but it doesn't mean that 100% accessibility. Uh, let's focus on working on these and fixing it, whenever, whichever website we are working on, we can start with Lighthouse. But after Lighthouse, what next, right? So let's start with the basics, document object model. So we work a lot in elements panel, right? So whenever we are creating something, we come here and we see that what is the issue. Uh, we see that, OK, whatever we are creating, how does it work? Or maybe somewhere, OK, this is a button. Fine. Styles and everything, we come here, we debug it, or we fix it, right? So this is usually what, is, what represents how the user sees our website. So whatever we write in HTML translates to here. And this is responsible for painting our web page, whatever we see visually. But the, all the assistive technologies that I showed you and more, there are lots of assistive technologies, right? Like keyboards, screen readers. Uh, they do not use this information directly to pass on the information, right? So there, there is a layer of API in between. So this is our website. This is our document object model, the, the tree. but how does this information go to the assistive technologies? There is another layer in it, which is called accessibility tree. So uh, what the browser does that we don't need this information for accessibility tree. Accessibility tree is for just uh, giving the information that what is uh, this particular, let's say, node, what is its name, description, what is the value, what is the different states, and all. So what it does that it selectively creates an accessibility tree out of this, and that information is passed on to all the different accessible uh, technologies. So in the DevTools, there's a very nice way of seeing the accessibility tree. So there's this icon here, which is the accessibility tree icon. Uh, I can click on this and actually translate the entire DOM tree into accessibility tree. So now, what we are seeing here is how this information is going to assistive technology. So this is essentially the accessibility tree of this web page. And uh, this gives a very nice information and very basic. Styles we don't need and everything. This is not what we need. We just need the very specific information. So accessibility tree. Uh, so what we see is name, description, role, state. Name is anything. If there's a text or something, that is name. So for example, here, I can't read the name, so this one, <laughs> male. <laughs> male is the name. Uh, then uh, the state, let's say it's focusable. Uh, then description, if there is more in description or context about it, I will show it in a while. That comes in description. And uh, what else? The role, so the role is link. So And link is a semantic, uh, right? So this is the information which comes. And this is pretty important, because uh, I think that uh, it's good to convert this into accessibility tree and see if all the nodes, and also to understand how our nodes are getting translated and how the information is really passed on to the assistive technologies. But this gives you whole tree. This might be a bit more overwhelming, let's say. like. OK, the people who specifically work with accessibility tree, they can um, easily pick things maybe from here. But for us, if we are starting, it can be a bit more overwhelming. So uh, in this pane, OK, mm, let me pull it up. Yeah. So there is also like styles, computed, everything. There is something in the end which is called accessibility pane. Uh, this gives us, uh, we can inspect a specific node and understand all about it. So for example, instead of looking at everything and feeling that, OK, what I need to check, what do I need to not check, let's go and maybe inspect one of these. 
So this. So this is the uh, node I want to, let's say, um, inspect and understand accessibility information about it. So when I inspect this in accessibility pane, I can see multiple information here. This is just to enable all the three. This I can close. Uh, let's go with this information. So this is the main information. Name, mail, why? Because it also gives us how did it derive that value from. For example, here, there are multiple ways in which a name can be derived. And how did it derive? So there was a title, but there was a contents. And this also gives you a hierarchy that which one will be more preferred, so which has higher priority. So if we have multiple things, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and everything, so which one gets prefer preferred? So here, contents get preferred. Uh, and contents comes from image, because we have an image. And here, how does the name come from? Because we have alternative text on this image. So we can see all this information here that where is the value being passed from. Then description, there is no extra dis description here. So it just picks the all text, I guess, with this mail. Role, very important. I want to know link, button, like input, whatever, the role. Then. Focusable, yes, it's a link, so it is focusable. And we have no extra values on it, like maybe tab index minus one or something. Sometimes it can be like that, and then it makes it not focusable and everything. So this. Then there is one more thing in accessibility pane, which is source order. So we can, like, let's say if I get a, a parent. So source order, uh, one thing which I think is lacking, I would love to see the source order of the entire page, which is like how when you tab, what is the order of tab? So when the user is tabbing through keyboard, it shouldn't be like it's going from header to footer, then something like it, sh it, sh it should be linear and it should be understandable, right? Sometimes we write styles and everything, and then we uh, put one thing before other. Like with style, we can do anything. We can put footer before header in HTML, and still the footer appears in the end in our web page, right? But while style changes the appearance, it does not change the order of the DOM. And so the source order remains zigzag. So that we can test. But here the limitation is that we can only test it for, let's say, a parent. And if we can inspect a parent that has few uh, clickable children inside it, then it will give us source order of that. And so generic, and if I say, I think it should show. So. OK, so here, which is, of course, a proper source order. So it, it gives me order that, OK, this is the tab order of all these uh, focusable elements inside this page uh, or inside this parent, which is good. This is nice. So what I want to show you is about accessibility of values. Uh, I just have a small demo. Just uh, the code is not important here. I, it's just a small form. Uh, what I want to show is that this password field, okay? Because in passwords, so everything else is like if we see other, like let's say first name. Uh, here it shows, okay the first name. And we have more information here, because it depends upon node to node. Uh, so it's input. We see all this information from here. The name is first name. Where does it derive from? It tells me that, OK, we have a label, and it had a four attribute. And this is how the name is getting derived from. The role is text box. It's focusable, editable, and all the multiple things, which is very important for our assistive tech users as well, for them to understand what they can fill in, what they cannot. But I want to show about the description. So this is a password field, which is good. Uh, and then there is an extra information about the password. So this password has this information that password must be, like it can be more, but it's just a basic example, that it must be minimum eight characters. So uh, this is what comes in description. And how does it come in description? It's actually. So 
Uh, this is the extra information, and this is what comes in description. So whatever we put ex information, important information about any um, node, that comes in description. And this is a good point to also show the ARIA attributes uh, with, again, a uh, side note that we shouldn't be using ARIA always, so we only need to use the ARIA attributes when it is really necessary. For example, here. Here, we really wanted to uh, let the assistive technologies know that there is some extra information about this field. And this we can do by something called ARIA described by. So what we can say is, where is the code? Um, so we have a span which has the value and we connect it to the input saying that, hey, this has some extra information. Please use this element to provide that information to the user. And so all the ARIA things that we have in any um, node, in any element, that too animated. OK, can hear properly, right? Perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this comes in ARIA. So all the things that we have in ARIA will come here. This is also very good for debugging because sometimes, and I've seen this in live uh, projects where we had to debug, that we wanted to uh, have a specific text for our elements, but the screen reader users were hearing totally different. OK, so why? Because we also had some ARIA label or label by, and that takes precedence. So even if I have the label here as password, and I go ahead to input and I actually add something called ARIA label or ARIA labeled by. So for screen readers, that will be a more prioritized. So when I see, I see password, but if ARIA labeled by says that, hi, you can add anything here, so that is what will the screen reader users use uh, here. So this is important for us so that we can um, actually inspect these and see that the right information is being passed on to our users, OK? So this was accessibility tree, pane, source order, rendering. This is, again, something which is very cool, which I really like. In, um, and I'm going to remove form and put animation for a while. So if I hope nobody has any issues with animation. But if you have, then don't see screen for a while, because I'm going to show <laughs> example of animation stuff. But before that, I can also show the dark mode. So there are certain um, user settings right, which we have. For example, the users can choose that I want to see maybe dark mode, like there are multiple issues for which like sometimes I also like to use dark mode because I have migraines. Then some people also might not choose to see lots of animation. So they can also come here and say, it's also in every machine that, uh, you know, reduce motion for me. And once you set these for your machine, we as developers, when we are creating anything, we should honor these settings. We should respect our user settings. And how can we do that? There is uh, media queries to do that. But to test it, one way is to go to the system, change the settings, and then go back to web page and test it that, OK, does it work or not? The other way is, oh, OK, this one. Sorry, I'm trying to show you something, but it's in my this screen, and it doesn't come here. Or does it come? OK. so. <laughs> Here, so like uh, in our um, um, all the systems, we can search for different accessibility settings. We can say that, hey, I want to see reduced motion, uh, and it should be able to uh, slow down the animation or whatever we have written for that. So let's first see the dark mode. So in Chrome DevTools, again, I think, I don't think, command, should be, nope. OK, come on. I forgot the uh, rendering uh, 
rendering on what do you call it shortcut chrome dev tools wow anyways yeah command shift v what was i pressing uh, anyways let's see oh command shift p i'm pressing command option p okay command shift p <laughs> in mac and there should be something different for windows uh, here we can say rendering uh, and it actually shows a lots of things to us um, and here we can actually select multiple things we can emulate different types of uh, color schemes we can say dark scheme we can say light scheme and we can test if whatever we are we have written code for does it work or not then we can emulate multiple different things like uh, what i specifically want to show is vision deficiency we can emulate different types of vision deficiencies for our users we can how blurred vision let's say an example of blurred vision reduce contrast some types of color blindness like achromatopsia which is basically just black and white gray scale so these are the things that we can emulate we can emulate them by this which is the rendering panel we can also emulate them directly command shift p and we can say emulate and then we can emulate these from here okay uh, so what i am trying to show now is for reduce motion so this is the animation it's good go ahead and put all the animation that you want but some of the users again i am one of those users they do not like to see animations like it makes dizzy and like there are different conditions that happen so what we want to do is that they will say that okay i don't want to see animation or i want to see a reduce motion our job is to respect that settings and write code so that they don't uh, get affected by these so for example here i'm going to say reduce right i'm going to emulate this nothing happens why because i did not write the code as such so uh, there are different ways to write this code but the specific way is one of the ways is that don't add animation by default add it only when user does not have any preference like he like the user they say that okay i don't have any preference and so go ahead and add it so this is what i did so now if i refresh so what i have done is that since the animation is added when user has no preference and since right now i have a preference that i do not want to see motion or reduce motion so it just stopped we can also make it little less light like uh, very subtle but it depends upon us uh, but yeah we need to respect user settings and these are the ways in which we can test for all these directly from our browser uh, dev tools vision deficiencies conditions all info i think this is something which uh, you might uh, have seen already so whenever we inspect something there is also this let me see if i can let me not do that in but uh, if the hover thing you can see that there is also accessibility information that comes when we are inspecting something so this is also a good information sometimes we can directly see it from here as well two more minutes <laughs> some bonus tips so this is about let's say that uh, when we are debugging something and uh, i am going to come to this app which is i have been using this to demo how inaccessible websites can be for more than a year now it still remains inaccessible so i can still show um, let's say for example here let me tab through things i am going to tab but we don't see focus anywhere right like so how can we emulate it so like and how i can see that what is really the issue so these are just the bonus tips but uh, i think i will go at least one minute over but okay so in styles we can say hover and we can use focus or something to actually focus that here and see that what are the styles which are the culprit here outline none is the culprit so these are some of the ways in which we can actually debug for some of the issues one of the ways is which i really like is when you are using a screen reader or something just go to the body right and say that just apply a filter so that sometimes when we are using a screen reader or something still since we can see things we still sometimes get that uh, information and we might not really be that aware that okay this might be an issue so we can blur something and then try to uh, uh, go through a screen reader or something and to emulate a better 
you know, like blurred vision or something. Then the last one is for tabbing because sometimes when the focus order is not there and we want to see actually uh, that uh, where the current active element is, we can watch on document.active and then it will give me the correct uh, element. So these are my three bonus tips. I have an action item for you all that uh, like try to test whatever you are working on using some of the tips and if you find something, fix it. If not, good job. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, so you are asking how can we show a, when the password is incorrect, how do we show that information to the users? Yeah, because I think it's kind of it's a line between uh, security and between accessibility. Yeah. You know that in general we say show less information for the attackers. For example, if username and password is correct, it doesn't say that username is correct. It just says that credentials are correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is like, uh, uh, what is the right way of showing if the password is incorrect? Because we also want to make things secure for the user. Uh, I think I, it's totally valid. The, with accessibility, the thing is that when we are showing the error, that whatever the error is, let's say, let's think security, and we say that, hey, uh, either username or password is incorrect, please check or try again, right? So we don't give specific information, of course, like uh, showing uh, or making things accessible doesn't mean that we are trying to make something insecure. But the point with accessibility is that when, let's say, the, uh, there is an issue with the form, OK, uh, the, when the users who can see it, right, when the users who can see it, they can still see that uh, there is an error. Uh, so Maybe there is an error uh, below, like here, that, OK, uh, something was wrong. For accessibility, the thing is that that should also be read out to the, let's say, screen reader user. So like kind of an aria live reason. So for accessibility, we don't need to change the message. The uh, point is to let the message known to all the users, not only visual users. So the user who cannot see should still be able to hear that what was the error. So that is what we are trying to include them also. The message can totally be secure or whatever we are trying to say. Like it can remain same for both. But the thing is, it should be like accessible to our users, like all users. So for that, I think we, for errors, we use something called ARIA Live. So when the message shows here, it gets inserted into a, let's say, element, which is read out loud to the user. And if we don't use it, it can be a big error or a success or anything, but the users who cannot see the screen, they would not understand that what is the status. So that is the only thing. Does it make sense? Yeah. OK, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any more questions? <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> OK, so if you have any questions later also, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn or something, or ask me later. <laughs> but. Thank you.